I titled this sermon, Obsessed. Maybe you'll figure out why as we go. But let me answer this question. Raise your hand if you ever attended, maybe somebody here did. Did you ever go to an Elvis concert? Anybody here raise your hand? Anybody? One, two, couple of people went to an Elvis concert. I never did uh, make one, uh, but I met somebody uh, a while back who, uh, who did. And I was uh, impressed as they began to tell me the story of, of how much uh, they, they love and have loved Elvis. And in fact, as we were talking, they pulled some sunglasses out of their pocket and put them on. And you remember those gold sunglasses that Elvis used to wear with the little rings that kind of go down the, the, the arms of it? Uh, and I was very impressed. And I thought, wow, that, that's something. I said, uh, so he said, oh, he said, oh yeah, I've got, the, I've got the whole outfit. I've got the, I said, you got the sideburns too? He said, oh yeah, I've got it all. And I thought, now this is somebody who was probably at some point obsessed with Elvis. Obsessed with Elvis. Do you know somebody, do you know anybody who's obsessed with someone or something I was thinking about things we might be or people we might be obsessed about. I thought about Taylor Swift. There are apparently a lot of people who are obsessed with her. I thought about the election that's coming up. There are a lot of people that are just obsessed with it. I'm, I'm kind of tired. Are you all ready for it to be over with? But there are people who are obsessed with it. I, I thought about sports teams. I thought about social media image. I, I thought about some people are obsessed with working out and exercise, maybe a good thing to some extent. Some people are obsessed with their cell phones or their tablets. There's so many things that we can be obsessed with, so many people we can be obsessed with. Sometimes being obsessed with something or someone is a good thing. You know, eating healthy is good. Debbie makes me have a green smoothie almost every morning I don't care for it but I do it just to make her happy but there's some things that people are obsessed with so I want us to look at first Peter chapter we're in chapter two finally we've made it that far and I want us to read just uh, three verses the first three verses there so if you have your Bible it'll be up on the screen uh, but I'll invite you to stand and let's read this together as Peter talks to us about how we live as those who follow Christ. Let's read this together out loud. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So I've been giving you some words to underline as I've underlined them in, in my Bible. So today I would, I would say, okay, let's underline rid yourself. I underlined that. I underlined crave, the word crave. I'll talk a little bit about that. I underlined the phrase pure spiritual milk. I underlined so that. Somebody taught me you should always do that. I underlined grow up and I underlined tasted. I probably uh, could have underlined the whole thing. But that's what I did. Peter says, that last part, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I love that you tied in uh, the songs and, and all around the goodness of God today because that, that, is, that is so true. If we have truly tasted that the Lord is good, then that's going to impact how we live. And so my first question to you is this, other than have you ever seen an Elvis concert, have you tasted, have you tasted that the Lord is good? Have you tasted his goodness? Oh, I pray you have. You know, I, I've asked the question of myself as I've been studying this and preparing for these messages. What is it that God wants me to know, do, and feel as a result of the reading that I've done? And so I had a couple of thoughts here as well today. Sounds like what the Lord is telling us in this passage is there are some things that we should stop doing so that we can start doing some other things. So I must stop some things so that I can start some other things. And I, I would probably add a word in here. Let's stop some bad things so that we can start some good things. That's kind of what he's saying here. 
There's this new life that you've been given if you have committed your life to Christ, and so it should look different than your old life. And so he's reminding us here as he's writing to us that we need to take this seriously. And there's some things that we need to get rid of. He said, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. And so as I, I read that, what he's saying is you got to rid yourselves. you got to get rid of it. you got to stop it. These are some things we need to stop. And who is the actor in this command? Who is it? It's us. It's you and me. It's almost you could write the word in, you rid yourselves of these things. You could have done that. Get rid of it. That's what he's saying. So, so I wonder, uh, what is it that we, you and I, need to get rid of? What do we sense God telling us? Even those of us who've been walking with the Lord for a long time, there are still some things in our lives that we need to get rid of. What do you think that might be? Peter says he identified five specific things, which must have been a serious problem with these early Christians that, that this letter is, is written to. And here are the five things. The first one is malice. You know what malice is? It's the desire to harm someone or the feeling of pleasure at someone else's misfortune, which is not good. Another definition says it's the desire it's to desire Ill, Ill will toward others. That's malice malice it's not a good thing and then he said deceit we know what deceit is it's to mislead or to cheat or to give a false appearance or impression to lead astray to impose a false idea being deceitful to obscure the truth he said you got to get rid of it then he said hypocrisy listen if you read the gospels you can't miss the fact that jesus doesn't care for hypocrisy at all and so here we hear again we got to get rid of it pretending to be something that we're not that's hypocrisy. And then he said, get rid of envy, jealousy over the blessings and achievements of others. Have you ever been envious of others? And then slander. That's a, that's a hard one. To speak critically of another person with the intent to harm, to hurt, to cause harm. And so I wonder, do we need to get rid of any of these? Or, or, or maybe it's something else for us because Peter's going to add to that if you look down in verse 11 he's going to add to that he says this dear friends I urge you as foreigners and exiles we talked about that a couple of weeks ago we live in this world but we're not to be of this world as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul so it's a broader um, list of things that we need to get rid of sexual sin, sinful desires it says we're to abstain from them which means we keep away from them move away get away from them stop these things and why do we do that here's what he said because these things wage war against our souls all of these things do you know, some of them wage war physically against our bodies, but, but the real harm here that we're trying to avoid is the, the war against our soul, our soul, which is the essence of our being. It is. And this is true regardless of our age. I wish we got to an age at some point in our lives where we can say, you know what, these things aren't waging war against my soul anymore. But the reality is, as long as Satan is still active then he's going to work against our souls so they wage war against our souls and, and and Peter is saying through the Holy Spirit we gotta stop this so what do we need to stop so that we can start something else and here's here's the thing it's not like the the Lord is just being hard on us when we hear this truth it's that the Lord knows what is best for you and me that's part of his goodness that we're talking about, that once we taste and see that goodness, it's part of that goodness. He knows what's best for us. He'll bring to mind, maybe this morning, something that we need to stop so that we can start something up. Stopping these things is part of our faith journey. Taking up the other good things is part of our faith journey. You know, even after Paul had the experience on the road to Damascus where Jesus appeared to him, there were some things that 
Paul needed to stop so that he could take up and start some other things. He writes about that in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 9. In just one, one verse, he says this, We expected to die because of all that was happening to them. But look what it says. As a result, here's what we stopped. We stopped, we needed to get rid of relying on ourselves so that we could take up relying only on God who raises the dead. It's true of all of us. And I wonder what it is that God's placing on our hearts today. That's the first thing that I took away from this passage this morning. The other part that I took away from uh, the passage is this. God's expecting you and me to grow and to keep growing in our faith he's expecting that Uh, you know we can't just say this we can't just say well I gave my life to Christ we need to teach this to these youth who discovered this truth this weekend listen you can't just say I'm saved and that's it I got to keep growing I got to keep moving closer to Christ in my faith walk I can't say I'm saved therefore I'm done that's not anywhere in the Bible at all Once you and I become a Christian, there's an expectation by our Heavenly Father that we will grow stronger, we'll grow in our faith. And it's true. Peter said this, we read it together, like newborn babies, we need to crave, there's that word, pure spiritual milk. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to crave it. That's how I grow in my faith. I'm supposed to crave what's known as pure spiritual milk. And I, I thought about this word crave and what, is it, what does it mean? We probably know, but I looked it up. It, here's what it means in the Bible. It means to long for greatly, to long for greatly. And so I was asking the content, I was talking about cravings. And, you know, anytime you think about cravings, I think about our, our wives and mothers, for some of us, that, that craved certain things while they were pregnant. Do you remember that? Did any of you ladies have any special cravings while you were pregnant? We, we asked the group, uh, the content team, and this was either them or their moms or maybe uh, somebody that they know. Here's some, of the, here's some of the list that they came up with. Obviously, pickles is one. And I say, Lord bless you. I hate pickles. I just do. And that, if I had a craving for that, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably starve with that. Mexican food. Somebody craved Mexican food while they were pregnant. Somebody else, I think it was either them or somebody they know, they crave, get this, dirt. Have you ever heard of that? And they would actually eat dirt while they were pregnant. I've never heard of that. Somebody else pointed out, yeah, there are people who eat kaolin. Did you know that? Kaolin, the chalk that's found in middle Georgia. Somebody mentioned there's some people who crave toilet paper. I, I, there's some strange cravings. Uh, you, you, maybe you can figure out who it is on our staff that uh, may have done that. But then this is my favorite. I think this was my favorite. My favorite was this one. Um, And this is somebody in the church whose mother uh, craved, when she was pregnant, she craved the smell of fresh cut grass. And so she would make the dad, the husband, drive her around while she was pregnant to find lawns that had been freshly cut. Can you imagine that? Because she was craving the smell of fresh cut grass. That's interesting. I remember the things that Debbie didn't crave. I mean, I remember the things that made her nauseous when she was pregnant. Do you remember those things? A couple of things we identified during the content team. Somebody said mustard. That would make them nauseous. And, and I remember Debbie's, Debbie's was brushing their, her teeth. And somebody else said, yeah, that was my problem too when I was pregnant, brushing my teeth. So can you imagine going nine months without brushing your teeth? <laughs> Here, here's another word for craving. Another word for craving is to be obsessed with that's where the word came from for the title today to be obsessed with and to be obsessed with something or someone is to be unable to stop thinking about that whatever it is Peter says we're supposed to crave look what he says pure spiritual milk pure spiritual milk so I ask the question so what is pure spiritual milk I think we might know what that is pure spiritual milk and I came up with three Uh, ways to identify three things that are pure spiritual milk here's the first one and this is the one that he's primarily talking about here it's the word of God we're supposed to crave 
the Word of God. So, so that we spend a lot of time learning and growing as we read the Word of God. We're supposed to crave, the second one was this, the pure spiritual milk is the teachings of Jesus. Read the Gospels over and over again and, and all of the New Testament to see what Jesus taught about how we're supposed to live. You know, sinful desires, we just read, wage war against our souls. The Word of God, the teachings of Jesus, nourish, strengthen our souls, satisfy our souls. I, I saw this. I thought this was good. If our consumption of the world is outweighing our consumption of the Word of God, then I can guarantee you that the world is shaping our view of what's right, what's holy, and what's good, and not God. We're supposed to crave pure spiritual milk, the Word of God, the teachings of Jesus. But then I thought, this is really, I believe, what, Paul, what Peter is getting to here. We're supposed to just crave Jesus. Jesus. He's the one that we're supposed to crave to be obsessed with, to think I've got to have it. There's nothing else that can satisfy my craving other than Jesus Christ. We had some teaching last weekend from J.D. Walt out at Camp Tiger, and then we had some more teaching on Monday with him with some pastors. And he said something at one of those two events. I couldn't remember which one. He said something that stood out with me. Here's what he said. We've got to become obsessed with Jesus. I think he was talking to us pastors. We, we've got to become obsessed with him so that he is our every thought. This is what we want the most is just Jesus. Just Jesus. I can't stop thinking about Jesus. It reminds me of David writing in the Old Testament. You remember this passage in the Old Testament? It stands out from Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water. You remember this one? So my soul pants for you, my God. That's obsession. That's what we're supposed to be obsessed with, is with Jesus. I wonder, are, are, you, are you obsessed with him? So I asked some questions. Here, here are my three questions I would ask with this one. Do I desire to grow? Do I desire to? Or do I think, hey, I'm saved, I'm done? Second one is this, do I really want to change? If so, How? What's he asking me to get rid of? Third one, how deep is my desire, my obsession for Jesus? Here's what Peter says. If you read on, I hope you'll read the rest of the chapter. Here's what Peter says about Jesus. He says, Jesus is going to be one of two things to us. He's either going to be our living cornerstone or he's going to be a stumbling block. Here's what he writes. In verse 6, for in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. You can build on this cornerstone, and your foundation will be sure. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And look what he says in verse 8, the stumbling block. A stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. They don't listen to him when he says, you need to get rid of this. And they stumble, which is also, he says, what they were destined for because they, they never intended to obey him. They're not going to obey him. God expects us to grow. We need to become obsessed with Christ. And then I'm going to finish with this one, the last part, because I got this is my favorite part of chapter 2. It's knowing who we are. You and I are royal priests. I just love that whole idea. Peter says we're royal priests. He actually says it twice in this chapter, if you look at it. And I thought, what in the world does he mean by this? How are we royal priests? And, and I wondered, what is it that a priest does? A priest stands between the people and God and offers himself and offers sacrifices to God for the people. That's what he's saying to us. We, we are to act as priests. It's not just the pastors that do that. All of us 
He's saying you are a royal priest. Look what he says in 1 Peter. He's talking at first about those who disobey, the ones I just talked about, that Jesus is to become a stumbling block. But here's what he says in verse 9. But you are not like that, like those who disobey. For you are a chosen people. You are a chosen people. You are royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. I, I just love that. If, if, if you don't receive anything else, you should take that today and put it on your mirror. And every morning when you get up, you need to say, I am a chosen people. I'm a royal priest. I'm a holy nation. I am God's very own possession. Because here's what else he's going to say. As a result, guess what you get to do? You and I get to do. We get to show others the goodness of God so they can taste it. That's what I tell you every week when we leave here. Live your life in such a way that others might be drawn to Christ. For he called you and me out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Keep going. Once you had no identity. Once you should say had no identity as a people. Now you are God's people. That's who you are. And the next line, once you received no mercy, but now you have. Because of God's goodness received his mercy. That's who we are. Once I was a nobody. There was a time when you and I were nobodies. But now because of God's mercy, we are somebody. And who did this for us? Not us. Out of his goodness, God did it for us through Jesus Christ. And here's Peter's description of what he did for us. It's in this chapter. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit. There's that word we're supposed to get rid of. Was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. He could have, but he didn't. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins. Peter knew this because Peter saw it in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you and I have been healed. You and I have. For we used to be like sheep going astray. But now, but now, you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's who we're supposed to be obsessed with. Those who become obsessed with Jesus will surely taste his goodness. It's absolutely true. And so I wonder, what do you need to stop? What do you need to start? How are you growing? What are you craving? And do you understand who you are? A royal priest, a holy nation, God's own possession. Because of his goodness, that's who we are. Here's some next steps. Maybe fill it out. I need to stop this and start this other thing. Fill it in. What is it? Second, I will become more obsessed with Jesus. Third, maybe this is you, like some of those youth. I need a real relationship with Jesus. I really do, so I can grow up in my faith. And third, with election coming, I skipped this piece, but you need to read it this week. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 speaks to those in authority. You want to read that as we look at the election coming. God's been so good to us. His goodness is absolutely true. And once we taste it, we want more of it. And I pray you have. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for inspiring Peter to share what he knew of Jesus Christ and what he knows through the Holy Spirit that we're supposed to be. And just thank you for that word. Help us, Lord, to get rid of the things we need to, to be obsessed with you, to grow in our faith, and to understand that we are, we are your own possession. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.